and I'm there. Ooh, perfect. And I've just shared my screen, so can everybody see my slides now? Good. Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Megan, and to the rest of the organising committee for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, it's a huge um, privilege to be able to talk to you about my work, and I'm just really sorry not to have been able to be with you in person. Um, but it's um, interesting to discover what it's possible to do via, via Zoom, especially if you don't get Zoom bombed, which was a new experience for us just now. Um, I think we've all learned something there. We should have passwords on our talks. Okay, so um, what I want to do today um, is to um, address the question of um, obesity um, in humans um, and particularly ask what is the role of limited and unpredictable food. So you're probably all aware that we as a human race are getting fatter and fatter. These data show um, clinically severe obesity um, in the United States um, since. Um, 1986 um, for various different classes of, of, of obesity here, so different BMI categories. And you can see that um, they are all um, going up quite alarmingly. And I think we're all aware that that's, this has huge consequences for um, human health and also well being. So we need to try and understand um, some of the factors that are responsible um, for this phenomenon. And I think it's unlikely to be something very simple, but what I want to try and do today is explore whether taking an ethological approach um, to obesity um, can um, give some new insight into this problem. One thing I should say is that these changes that we're seeing here are far too fast to have been changes in genes. So although we've heard a lot about um, um, genes for obesity, um, changes in gene frequencies can't be explaining these patterns. Um, it must be something to do with our environment and, and how we're interacting with it. So if we look at the evolutionary medicine literature, the usual explanation given for the human obesity pandemic um, is the evolutionary mismatch hypothesis. So this is um, um, given by, by many different authors. Um, and the idea really is that human decision-making mechanisms um, are optimized for an ancestral environment where calorie dense foods such as um, honey were scarce and hard to access. Um, and so we had, we had uh, motivations for accessing these foods whenever we could. But in modern environments where high calorie foods are very abundant and easy to access, these mechanisms lead to overeating, um, especially of energy dense foods. So that's kind of an idea that you'll see a lot in the evolutionary medicine literature. Um, the trouble is it has a really hard job in explaining some of the patterns we see in modern human obesity. Um, so what I'm going to focus on really today is the variation within populations in obesity. So I'm plotting here um, just the distribution of BMIs. Um, this is for um, adult um, American women. Um, and what you can see is that there's huge variation from kind of the mid teens in BMI up to um, above 60. Um, so there's a lot of variation within populations. And interestingly, also, um, poorer people tend to be fatter in developed countries. So on the right hand side here, I'm showing a graph which plots the ratio um, of, of low income to high income um, women um, from, from this data set on the left. Um, so um, a ratio of above one means um, that poorer people are, are fatter than, than richer people. And what, you'll, what you see is that for every um, decile of this distribution on the left, um, poor people are fatter um, than, um, than richer people. So the, the data is above one in this graph. Um, so this pattern would be quite hard to explain via the evolutionary mismatch hypothesis because you would think that if anything, rich people um, would have um, greater access to food than, than poorer people because they've got more money to, to buy it with. So why would you expect this pattern from, from evolutionary mismatch? Interestingly, variation in fatness is not restricted to humans. Um, and um, here's some data from my study species, the European starling. Um, we don't calculate BMI quite the same way in birds. We, we plot um, their body mass as a function of their tarsus length, their foot length. 
um, and we look at uh, residuals from, from this sort of a regression. So you've got birds that are, are fat for their size and birds that are um, thin for their size on this graph. And if you plot um, a distribution of residual body weight, you can see that just like with humans, there's huge variation in body weight in the starlings. Um, and just like with humans, there are some um, quite exceptionally fat um, individuals um, in this um, small um, group of birds. So we're seeing this kind of variation um, within populations of both humans and animals in, in body weight. So what I want to really try and address today is why are some individuals fatter than others within a population? So I want to switch the focus from thinking about mean obesity um, to variability in fatness within populations. Um, and if we do that, then behavioral ecology has some very useful theory to offer, which probably many of you are already aware of, but I will quickly go over this. So the idea is that fat has both costs and benefits. In humans, we just tend to think about um, the, the costs of fat, but um, fat has benefits um, and animals, um, animals um, will um, have a lower probability of, of starvation um, the fatter they are. So if we pro plot probability of starvation against body fat, um, the fatter you are, the lower your probability of starvation. In an animal such as a starling, um, the costs of fat are likely to be something like probability of predation. So as you get fatter as a starling, you become less maneuverable and therefore more vulnerable to being, being caught by predators. So if you have um, um, a situation like this, um, where there are trade-offs, um, costs and benefits to fat, um, then animals should minimise the joint probability of, of starvation and predation in this situation, which is at this point here on this graph. Um, and this gives you um, an optimum fatness given your probability of, of, of starvation um, and predation. And there are many models that are based on, on this, this kind of a, an analysis of, of what's going on. So if we have a situation like this, then um, if the predation risk goes up in an environment, then um, this curve will, will shift um, and that will move optimum fatness um, downwards. So animals should get um, thinner if predation risk goes up. Equally, um, if starvation risk um, increases, then optimum fatness um, should, should increase. So with this kind of a model, we can start to explain why there might be variation um, in, in fatness within a population potentially. So um, we have summarized this idea in what we call the insurance hypothesis. So the idea is that the optimum level of fat to store depends on your probability of, of starvation. Um, thus animals should possess evolved psychological mechanisms for sensing and responding to cues of possible starvation risk um, in our environments. Um, and, the and the insurance hypothesis predicts that increased perceived starvation risk will be associated with, with higher body fat. Okay, so that's what we're calling the insurance hypothesis. And there are many models in the behavioral ecology literature that make this kind of um, argument, specifically usually for small birds. But we think this kind of argument could also apply to, to humans equally well because while predation risk may not be a major issue for, for modern humans, um, there are undoubtedly fitness costs to being um, obese. So as long as there's some kind of costs to being obese, that, um, then um, the logic of these models can still work. So it might be that you're more likely to have an accident. You might, may, might be more likely to fall over and, and hurt yourself. It might be that you're less good at attracting a mate or, or reproducing, but um, as long as there are some costs to being um, fat, then these kind of um, same kind of models that we have for small birds where, where the costs uh, are conceived in terms of predation risk could also apply um, in human populations. So there's lots of evidence that um, um, when um, food is, is unpredictable and there's a higher starvation risk, um, small birds um, put on weight. So just to show you some of our own data, um, this is data collected by um, our postdoc, Claire Andrews. Um, she had two groups of uh, wild caught starlings in the lab, um, a control group who had access to ad libitum energy dense food at all times. And she compared these with um, another group who had unpredictable food, um, whereby they were deprived of food completely for random 
five hour periods um, on five days of the week. And this went on for many weeks. Um, and this data here just shows um, the, the means and individual data um, for the two groups. And what you can see is that the unpredictable um, food group ended up um, heavier than the control group. Although there is still a huge a lot of, lot of variation here, um, but there was a difference um, um, over time in that the unpredictable birds um, did, get, did get fatter. And um, there are lots of other experiments of this type in the literature, mostly um, um, on small birds. Interestingly, um, a similar sort of thing um, may be going on in humans. So um, social scientists talk about what they call food insecurity, which is defined in humans as limited or uncertain ability to acquire nutritionally adequate and safe food in socially acceptable ways or uncertain ability or inability to procure food. So um, food insecurity in humans is measured by social scientists using questionnaires. So they'll ask you questions like, in the last 12 months, were you ever hungry but didn't eat because you couldn't afford enough food? So questions of this type contribute to questionnaires, which, which um, social scientists use to rate people according to their level of, of food insecurity. And in a lot of the analysis, people are, are classified as either food secure or, um, or food insecure, depending on how they answer these sorts of questions. Um, so this is interesting because this looks a lot like um, what we're talking about in the birds, sort of limited or, or um, um, limited ability to, to acquire food. And interestingly, if we look at the associations with food insecurity in humans, um, we find what the social scientists call the food insecurity obesity paradox, they call it. Um, what we see is that people who are more food secure um, are um, typically fatter um, in, in developed Western countries. So what I'm showing you here is data from a meta-analysis that we did of 125 papers. This was mostly American data sets that measured um, both food insecurity using these standard questionnaires um, and body mass index um, in people and looked at the associations between the two. Um, and what you can see in this forest plot is that overall, looking at all the associations that we managed to extract from the papers, um, the, um, the odds of obesity were 21% higher for um, food insecure humans. So um, an odds ratio of one here um, indicates no effect and anything to the right of it means um, obesity was more likely um, in, in food insecure people than in food secure people. So there was an association overall between um, food insecurity and obesity um, in humans, um, mimicking um, the experimental results that we have from small birds and suggesting there might be an association between limited or unpredictable food um, and, and body weight. Um, interestingly, you can see that that association survives being adjusted for um, socioeconomic status. So it's not just to do with poverty, interestingly. Um, it's mainly driven by women um, and um, also by people in um, high income countries. So it looks like you don't get this association in low income countries. Um, um, we can come back to that in the questions if you're interested in that. But um, overall, we do get this highly significant um, association between food insecurity um, and obesity. Okay, so um, you may well say these sorts of questions that are asked in the human questionnaire are getting at something very different from um, what behavioural ecologists are manipulating when we take away food from animals. Um, and um, people have doubted that these models created for birds could actually um, work for, for humans and that because um, human insecure, food insecurity is something just different. Um, and recently we decided to try and really look at whether it is different or not by analysing in more detail the behaviour of food insecure people. Um, and what you're, what you're seeing here is data taken from food diaries um, of um, Americans um, collected as part of the NHANES um, uh, National Health um, and Nutrition Examination, which is something the USA does um, annually. Um, so in these food diaries, people recorded um, every time they ate something, so that's a consumption event, and how much they ate, and it was quite carefully converted into um, how many calories they actually consumed each consumption event. So what we did was we used these food diaries to extract a whole lot of behavioural variables describing um, how people ate. 
So there are things in here like um, the top one in this list is the variability in the time gap between consumption events. So that's a lot like unpredictability in, in food, which is what we uh, manipulate um, in our bird experiments typically. Um, and what you see in this plot here, we've arranged the different um, behavioral variables um, in order of the effect size um, for looking at the association um, with food insecurity. And what you see is that the strongest association with food insecurity is this variability in time gap um, between meals. So if you have more variable gaps between your, your meals, your consumption events, um, um, you are um, more likely to be food, food insecure. So, so food insecure people, sorry, have, have higher, higher variability in time gaps. Um, they also have um, um, more um, variability in um, when they eat their first meal of the day. So this is the interday difference in their first consumption event. So there's quite a lot of evidence that food insecure people have um, more unpredictable patterns of eating compared with food secure people. And I think this is really nice because it gives us some confidence that the way we've been modeling um, the, the data in, in birds might actually be relevant to humans and that human food insecurity does share some features with the kinds of things we've been manipulating um, in, our, in our bird um, experiments. Something else I should point out before I leave this slide um, is that um, energy intake um, is no different um, um, in um, food secure and food insecure people in this data set. So it doesn't look like the food insecure people were actually eating more, despite the fact that we know that they are um, heavier. Um, so that's interesting, I think. We'll come back to that later. Okay, so um, what I want to do now um, is to um, move on and um, start to think about um, why, why we might be um, seeing these associations between um, um, food insecurity and obesity from a more mechanistic perspective. I've talked about the functional arguments, but what about the mechanisms? Um, how is it that um, food insecurity actually leads to obesity, especially given that last piece of evidence I showed you that there may not be differences in how many calories people are eating. Um, and for this part of the talk, I'm going to move from, from humans, where I started off, um, back to my favourite animals, which are um, European starlings. And I'm going to tell you about some experiments that we've been doing to um, uh, try and address this question um, in the starlings. So, um, going on to the, to, to the main question I want to look at, how does food insecurity induce mass gain? So this means going back to kind of basics um, of um, the body mass, um, the, the energy balance equation. So, so to gain body mass, um, the energy balance equation rather obviously requires that either um, we increase our um, energy intake um, or alternatively that we decrease our energy expenditure. And there are various ways in which we could do um, either of these different things. So you could increase energy intake by eating more food, which is what's normally assumed is going on in food insecure people, um, by eating more energy dense food, so changing the kinds of foods that you're eating. So both of these would lead to increased energy consumption, um, or possibly you could absorb more energy from the food that you actually eat without changing um, either of the first two things in this list. Um, for decreasing energy expenditure, um, you could move around less, you could vocalize less, which um, certainly um, uh, costs energy. We know that in birds, song is extremely expensive. So these are both forms of physical activity that you could reduce to save energy. Um, you could also um, reduce your um, resting metabolic rate in various ways. So um, you could reduce what's called the thermic effect of food, which is the amount of energy used in digestion of food, um, or basal metabolic rate. Um, so there are a lot of different strategies here um, that, that could be used um, to um, um, induce body mass gain in response to being exposed um, to, to food insecurity. And, um, as, I, as I've said, in humans, it's normally, assume, it's normally assumed that what, what happens is that food insecure people eat more or that they eat more energy dense food. So these are the things that people have focused on um, in the human literature. And interestingly, in the bird literature, in general, behavioral ecologists haven't actually measured these things. So we really don't know the answer to this question at the moment. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, really, um, it's really up in the air what, how it is that 
food insecurity or unpredictable food um, leads to mass gain. So what we did um, was a series of experiments on, on starlings. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about um, the experiments that we've done using um, this piece of apparatus that you can see here, which we call the social foraging system, which has really revolutionized um, our abilities to study um, mass regulation in these birds um, in a lot of detail. Um, so what, what we have here is a feeding station um, which has a little tiny perch that can accommodate a single starling, so one at a time. Um, this perch floats on top of um, a load cell um, which weighs the bird um, when it perches on here. Um, and um, this also contains an RFID aerial that can read an RFID tag, which is attached to um, the leg ring um, on, on the bird. So when the bird lands on here, it's identified by its RFID tag and it's weighed. Um, it can then get food in various ways. So we have a food hopper here that can be raised to allow feeding or lowered to remove food. And um, the birds, we can operate this from a computer remotely, so we can determine when the birds have food available. Um, and we can also um, schedule um, operant um, um, schedules um, on this apparatus so that, um, for example, the bird might have to peck a certain number of times at this illuminated pecking key before the food hopper will raise. So we can do a number of things with this kind of apparatus. Um, most importantly, we can have several birds living in an aviary. So what I want to show you here is the, the setup in our lab. So this is a typical aviary. Um, in this, um, in this um, film, you can see um, there are actually six birds in this room and they have two social foraging systems. There's one here, you can see a bird um, foraging on it at the moment. It's having to peck at the key in order to, to get access to the food hopper. So that bird's currently weighing itself and feeding. Um, so there's two of these SFSs in the room shared by six birds. Um, the room has quite a lot of enrichment. So it has perches where the birds can, can roost. It has a water bath, which they really enjoy um, using. Um, it has um, wood chippings on the floor so that they can um, explore um, and, and search for food in, in the wood chippings. There, there isn't actually any food down here, um, but it gives them the opportunity to explore their environment. You can see this bird is in the bath at the moment. Um, they really like having baths. So um, the idea with this is that um, we can generate a, an experimental setup where we can monitor the bird's weights in exquisite detail because we're getting weights every time that they feed. We can experimentally control their access to, to food um, and, and, and measure how this affects their, their foraging behavior. But also the birds have the opportunity to um, behave quite naturally. They can interact, they can squabble, um, they can bathe, they can, they can search in the, in the substrate. So they can do a lot of normal behaviors that um, perhaps wouldn't be possible for an animal like a laboratory rat living in, in a shoebox. Um, so I think it's important if you're trying to look at how the birds might change their behavior in response to food insecurity to let them have the opportunity to actually have some behavior to change. Um, so the idea is to have quite a naturalistic setup where the birds can live socially. Um, and obviously this is also good for their welfare because these are social animals that, that like, to, like to be together. So I think we can get um, much more scientifically interesting data in a more welfare friendly way um, using this, this kind of setup. So I should say that um, we've taken um, choice of food out of the equation um, in all these experiments I'm going to tell you about, that the food available in these SFSs is a, a single homogeneous diet um, that is um, a complete diet for the starlings. So we don't give them the opportunity to switch their diet type. So we're removing that, um, that possibility in this case. We're just looking at um, how, much, how much they're eating. Um, I think that's all I needed to say about that. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about um, is data from a total of four experiments done using this kind of setup. Um, the reason for talking about all four at once um, is that in the past I think I would have done a single experiment and, and written it up and published it, but um, I've been trying to move in my own work towards replicating things much more in response to the replication crisis in, in psychology and biomedical science. I think 
um, behavioral ecology and ethology hasn't suffered so much from the replication crisis, mainly because we don't normally replicate each other's work because we're all working on different species. But I've been quite alarmed by a lot of what's been coming out in, in psychology and biomedical science and have felt a real need to do a lot of replication. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about results from all four experiments because there were subtle differences between them and it's really only when you meta-analyze them and put them all together that a clear picture starts to evolve. Um, so that's sort of a general point I wanted to emerge from this talk that I think I'm moving towards a different way of working um, where we're trying to be much more sure that the results that we're publishing um, are something we really believe in and, and are quite general. Anyway, so to go back to these four experiments, um, there are some things I need to tell you about all of them. So all of them involved um, periods of food security, which are shown in turquoise, and food insecurity, which are shown in red. And these blocks basically correspond to week long periods. So in all experiments, it was a within subjects design where groups of starlings started off on food security, then they had either one or two weeks of food insecurity. And then in a couple of the experiments, they returned to food security again um, at the end. Um, after they'd had the food insecurity. So there's some variation in how long these different phases ran for um, in, in the four experiments. Um, there was also variation in um, how we had the birds arranged. So in a couple of the experiments, we had just two birds per aviary. Um, and when, when there were two birds, they had just one social foraging system. Whereas in these two experiments, we had six birds per aviary and two social foraging systems. So these experiments, two and three, had more um, competition for food um, between birds because there were more birds um, and fewer feeding stations per bird. So that was a little bit of extra variation between these studies. We also varied exactly how we generated the food insecurity. So um, in the first three experiments, we just um, lowered the food hopper so that the birds couldn't access the food at all. And we did this for 20 randomly chosen 20 minute periods um, between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. Um, every day. Um, the birds always had food available for the first two hours of the day um, in, in these studies. That was in food insecurity. Food security, they just had the hopper available all day long. So this manipulation was a lot more similar to what's been done previously in bird experiments, totally removing food for, for random periods of the day. Um, in this final experiment, we used an operant schedule where um, under food security, the birds had to peck the key and a peck would always lead to the hopper rising um, for 10 seconds of food access. Um, whereas under food insecurity, um, the probability of the hopper rising for a peck um, was reduced. So um, it was initially under food insecurity low um, 0.4 and then it went down to 0.2 under high food insecurity. So in this condition, um, the bird only had a 0.2 probability of a peck being, re a peck being reinforced with food. So there's quite a lot of variation between these four different studies, but they've got things in common um, as well. And I'm going to present the results um, um, from all four studies um, together in the graphs that follow. So I should say a little bit about how we estimated body mass from the social foraging system data. Um, what I'm showing here is a plot of um, time of day against mass. And this is data for a single bird on a single day. And you can see that we get a lot of um, mass readings for a bird on a day. Um, and there was uh, some, we had some kind of debates about exactly how to use these data. Um, and what I ended up doing was um, to describe these data by fitting a cubic polynomial, which in general fitted the data pretty well. Um, and we did this as long as we had at least 10 masses per bird per day, which is usually the case. Um, we then removed any data points that were more than three grams from the fitted line. The reason for this is that you get the odd um, outlier. There aren't any really bad ones on this graph, but you sometimes get a really bad outlier due to a bird perching badly or taking off while it's weighing itself or something. So we wanted to exclude impossible values. And there's no way a bird could change its weight by three grams within, within um, you know, an hour or, or two. So... Um, um, we removed data points that were more than three grams away um, from the fitted line. Um, we then refitted the line um, and then we used um, 
two points in the day to estimate um, dawn and dusk mass. And this was so that we could compare the weight of birds um, at a comparable um, point in the day on all days. Because if you think about it, not every bird would have a, a mass reading at exactly 8 a.m., for example. So this is a way in which we could compare um, the body weights of the birds um, at the same times of day. And you can see that there's the time of day matters quite a bit because starlings wake up light and then over the course of the day they put on between seven and 10, 10 grams before they go to bed at night. Okay, so that's how we got the mass data. So I'm going to show you um, a number of data slides now and um, these are all organized um, in the same way. Um, these are box plots for dawn body mass from the four experiments. Um, the boxes correspond to one week's worth of data and the food secure weeks are shown in turquoise and the food insecure weeks um, are shown um, in red. So what you see for dawn body mass, which is the empty mass of the bird when it first um, wakes up in the morning, um, when its gut's empty, um, is that in experiment one, um, we didn't really find any effect of food um, um, insecurity on body mass. We got a big effect in experiment two, um, not really much going on in experiment three and some evidence for something going on in experiment four. So birds either maintained or gained dawn body mass under food insecurity um, in these experiments. The pattern was similar for dusk body mass, um, although possibly a little clearer. Um, when we had some evidence here that the birds masses were going up under um, food um, insecurity and then dropping here when, when food became secure again. So a big difference in experiment two, a nice difference here with a drop back down again when, the, when it went back to food security and again evidence here. So, so birds either maintain or gain dusk body mass under, F, under food insecurity. Um, it seems like there's more evidence here that something's going on. Um, so that's the body mass data. Um, this is just the data from experiment two where we got the biggest increase just to show you how rapidly it occurred. So what I'm showing you here is days of the experiment um, and this is dawn mass um, and you can see these are box plots for the six birds on each day and what you can see is that um, dawn mass went up by about the third day of food insecurity um, um, and dusk mass went up almost immediately. So these are really, really rapid um, effects of the manipulation of, of, um, of food insecurity um, on the birds' body masses. So that's all very reassuring. It looks like we're getting some evidence that food insecurity does um, induce um, increases in body mass in our experimental system, replicating a lot of previous work suggesting that this is something that should happen. Um, Although there was quite a lot of variation and we were interested to try and understand why some experiments showed bigger effects than others. And this is an attempt to try and understand the source of some of that variation. So what we found by comparing the, the four experiments is that there were two things that seemed to affect um, how much weight the birds gained under food insecurity. Um, so what we found is that if they were light at baseline, so that's in the first food security condition, then they typically gained more weight um, under um, under food insecurity. So what I'm plotting here is the mean baseline mass of the birds in a room and this is the effect of um, food insecurity on dawn mass and you can see that the heavier they were at baseline the less um, they gained um, under food insecurity whereas if they were light at baseline they were more likely to get fatter. Um, so that was true overall. And there was also an effect um, of um, how much competition there was in the room. So if the birds had more competition for food, so that's um, in experiments two and three, um, they tended to gain more mass than um, if there was less competition for food. And that might be because they're basically facing higher food insecurity um, under um, higher competition. So we know that, that dominance does, um, dominance affects um, fat gain in birds. Um, I think we might be seeing something similar here. So um, we can explain some of the variation we saw between experiments um, in how the birds responded to, to food insecurity. So this is a bit more detailed data on the foraging behaviour of the birds in experiment four which had the operant task. So we could look at the pet rate of the birds on the social foraging system and what you can see is that the birds um, pecked um, more um, as the probability of reinforcement um, um, went down. So they upped their rate of pecking as you might imagine they would. Um, 
They also upped um, their consumption rate. So they were feeding from a hopper. So um, we couldn't control exactly how much they got in a reinforcement. Um, but we know that the birds were extracting more food in their 10 seconds um, under food insecurity than they were under food security. So their consumption during a reinforcement went up. Interestingly, um, their rate of reinforcements went down because although they pecked faster when the probability of reinforcement was lower, they didn't fully compensate. Fully compensating would have involved following these green diamonds um, and they weren't pecking fast enough to compensate for the reduced probability of reinforcement. So actually their, their rate of earning rewards um, went down. And what we can see um, from the next slide is that if we look at their total daily food consumption, um, they actually ate less under food insecurity on average. Um, so in experiment one here, you can see the total daily food consumption was lower um, under food insecurity. Not much difference here in experiment two, but again, it was lower in experiment three and lower in experiment four. So the birds were either maintaining or reducing their food consumption under, under food insecurity, which is the exact opposite of what's been assumed is going on in humans, interestingly. So if we put all this together, um, the birds are on average getting heavier, but they're also eating um, less, which seems really paradoxical. Um, and um, this suggests that what they're actually doing is um, increasing their energetic efficiency. So what, what I plotted here was the dawn mass maintained um, per gram of food consumed per day um, for, for the birds in this experiment. So, so basically, if you, if you can maintain a higher body mass um, on fewer calories, then you must be using your energy um, more efficiently. Um, so I'm plotting that across the four experiments. And you can see um, that birds always increase their energetic efficiency under food insecurity. So you can see that here. It's not significant here, but it was actually an increase. Um, it's significant here, and it's significant again um, here. Um, so... What I'm showing here is a meta-analysis of these findings that I've just um, presented to you. Um, I've actually split these down by aviaries because um, our food consumption data is only at the aviary level. So um, that's why I'm using aviaries rather than experiments here. It gives us a bit more um, power to, to, to look at these effects. Um, what, um, so what you see on average, I've, I've already showed you these data in, in more detail, but Dawn mass um, on average um, um, goes up under um, food insecurity, although it's not quite significant. This summary here doesn't quite, um, it does still cross the zero effect line here. So um, there's a, a, a marginally not significant effect of food insecurity on dawn mass. The effect on dusk mass is significant here, you can see. Um, but I should point out there's lots of variation um, between um, aviaries in, in both of these measures, as, as I've already discussed. Total daily food consumption on average went down under food insecurity. So the birds ate significantly less on average, although in a couple of um, aviaries, there was not really much difference. Again, quite a lot of variation. Um, when we look at energetic efficiency, so this is the grams of starling maintained per gram of food eaten per day. Um, all of the aviaries show an increase in energetic efficiency um, under food insecurity. And this is very significantly different from, from zero. So I think putting all of these experiments together, um, what we see is a suggestion that food insecurity makes birds increase their energetic efficiency um, in some way. So how are they doing this? Well, we collected various bits of data that might shed some light on this. Um, this is energy density um, of um, the guano that we collected from the aviary. So this was to try and look at whether the birds might actually be using the food that they eat um, more efficiently. So extracting more energy from the food that they eat. Um, and we did this for two experiments. We collected samples of guano every day from the aviary um, and we subjected them to bomb calorimetry so we could measure how much energy was in the, the guano coming out of the birds. Um, and in both experiments one and three, um, we found some evidence that the birds significantly changed um, how much energy they were extracting from their food over the course of the experiment. So in experiment one um, here, we saw um, a, a significant um, drop in the energy density of, of guano under 
um, food insecurity. Um, and again, you see a drop in experiment three here. Interestingly, in both cases, this um, drop um, was maintained when the birds were put back onto food security after, after, the, after the period of food insecurity. Um, and it's interesting to speculate why that might be. And um, one of the ideas we have is that starlings can actually change their gut morphology um, when they're exposed to um, high fiber diets. So it's known that they can actually increase the absorptive area of their gut by growing more microvilli when they're fed on a high fiber diet. And so maybe what they're doing is under food insecurity, they're actually um, changing their gut morphology so they can extract more energy from their food. And that's quite a slow change that's quite slow to reverse as well. So once you've done it, you're stuck with it for a bit, which would have implications for looking at um, uh, average fatness in animals um, over fluctuating periods of food insecurity if you can't change um, back quickly once you've made this kind of change to your, to your body. So that's, I think, really interesting. And um, I mean, nobody, as far as I know, has raised the prospect of anything like this going on in, in humans, but it, it's sort of something that I think we should possibly look at, although I don't want to do that experiment. <laughs> Okay, um, the other thing we looked at was um, some behavioral measures. So we looked at um, morning roosting behavior, and this is from experiments one, two, and three. Um, so this is the period when the birds always had ad libitum food available in the aviary, independent of which condition they were in. And we did find some indication that the birds were spending more time roosting during that morning period um, under food insecurity. So there was a rise in experiment two, a significant rise in experiment three. Um, in, in experiment one, we didn't really see it, but interestingly, when we tried to meta-analyze these results, this was really all being driven by um, one of the three aviaries. So for the other two, there was um, um, a, um, uh, a, a, an increase in roosting behavior under food insecurity. So um, it doesn't come out significant overall, but there's some suggestion here, I think, that the birds might be roosting more um, when they're in food insecurity. And um, this has to be a response to the conditions they've experienced the previous day, because at this point in the day, they don't know that food's gonna be unpredictable later in the day. Um, they have a whole week of food insecurity where the, the unpredictability starts at 11 o'clock each day. Um, so this must be some kind of general effect of being in a food insecure environment on these birds' behavior if, if, it, if it is something real here, which I think is really interesting that they might be kind of hunkering down and not spending energy, even during a time when they could have been eating um, when they're in a food insecure environment. Okay, so just to summarize the starling results, um, we've shown that the birds respond to food insecurity by increasing um, their energetic efficiency. And I think this is a new, a new finding. Um, it's partially explained by increased absorption of energy from, from food eaten. Um, and there's some evidence for physical activity um, reductions um, and that they were roosting um, more, so just sitting around doing nothing. Um, interestingly, um, the, the increased energetic efficiency seemed to continue after food security was reinstated in the couple of experiments where we did that indicating an asymmetry in the speed of the response to food insecurity and the recovery from it, which I think has very interesting implications for thinking about how um, body weight would, would respond to fluctuating periods of food insecurity and, and, and food security um, in, in humans if similar things were going on. So what about humans? Um, I mean, there's some evidence to suggest that similar mechanisms may operate in humans. So I showed you our NHANES data and the fact that we found no evidence that food insecure people eat more than food secure people. So maybe that's similar um, in humans. Um, it's hard to get good data on food consumption in humans, but um, the data that, that are there don't suggest any difference in consumption. Um, there are some longitudinal studies in humans looking at changes in household food insecurity. And interestingly, um, this nice paper shows that, that girls, um, when their household becomes food insecure, um, eat um, the same amount um, and don't change their diet, but they do gain weight. So that fits in very much with what we're seeing in our starlings. Um, the boys, on the other hand, um, don't gain weight, but they eat less. So in both boys and girls in this study, um, the data are compatible with an increase in, in efficiency and use of, of calories eaten. Um, 
Another interesting thing that comes out of the human data is that there's a very strong association between food insecurity and depression. And given that one of the symptoms of depression is feeling like you have no energy, not wanting to do anything, um, I'm very interested in the idea that those, those sorts of psychomotor retarded depression could actually be an adaptive response to perceived food insecurity in the environment. So I think that would be a really interesting thing to try and explore to see whether it's particularly the sorts of depression that have symptoms of low energy and not wanting to do anything that are um, associated strongly um, with food insecurity. And that's something we could actually do with, with the existing NHANES data. Um, the final little piece of evidence I found is that there is at least one randomized controlled trial in humans where they've manipulated the regularity of meal timings. So um, they have uh, people who have uh, a regular number of meals each day and they compare them with a group that have an isocaloric um, diet but divided into different numbers of meals each day. So some days they might get three meals, some days they might get nine meals. And what they found in this trial was that the metabolic rate reduced um, in the people who were on um, the unpredictable timings of meals. So that would really fit with them um, saving energy in response to perceiving some unpredictability in the timing of their meals. So I think what comes out of all of this is that really future work on humans should focus on the biological mechanisms mediating increased energetic efficiency um, rather than increased food consumption and we've really been focusing possibly on the wrong thing in relation to trying to understand um, how um, how food insecurity affects us um, so this is my last slide um, just to conclude a little bit um, so i think we need to take an ethological approach to understanding variation in human obesity um, i've argued that um, Similar functional arguments, um, namely this insurance hypothesis that I've outlined, could apply um, in both species. And we have data compatible um, with that um, in terms of um, both starlings and, and, and humans. Um, I've also suggested that similar proximate mechanisms could apply in both species. So um, there's little evidence that, that mass gain is driven by overeating in either the starlings or the humans. Um, um, in, instead, um, it looks like food insecure individuals are saving energy somehow and we really need to understand better um, how they're doing that. And I think there's likely to be a suite of different um, adaptations that they're using to do that. So, I mean, I think the final conclusion is that the comparative approach, I think, is proving very valuable in, in generating new ideas for human, human research. And I've had a lot of trouble over the years convincing people that starlings can tell us anything useful um, about, about human behaviour. But... I'm really starting to be convinced there's something in this. And, and if nothing else, I mean, the starlings have taught us that um, there are things we would never have thought about, like um, increased um, um, absorption of food, of energy from food that, that, that perhaps we should be looking at um, um, in human studies. So I think um, coming at this from the angle of a, an ethologist, a behavioral ecologist, um, is, is a very valuable approach that could, could lead us to ask questions we wouldn't have, have asked without the bird work. Okay, so I just need to finish by um, thanking all the people that have contributed to this work, um, particularly my husband Daniel Nettle and um, his um, European Research Council um, grant, Comstar, which was a, um, a grant to compare humans and, and starlings um, in various cognitive domains, and this is part of that, that larger body of work. Um, I need to thank our wonderful postdocs, um, Claire Andrews and Jonathan Dunn, who, who did a lot of the work um, that I've described today, uh, master's students um, and also undergraduates and research assistants who've, who've helped us um, with this work. Um, so thank you very much for your um, attention. I hope you've got something interesting out of this talk and I'd be very happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bateson. That was great. Um, there's tons of interest in questions, and I've got some as well, but I suppose I will put mine on the back burner. Um, and so here, I will read the first question here. This is from Georgia Mason. Yep. Do the human income data uh, control for the education level of people? And is that in any way a confound? Um, what can I say about that? So, um, 
measures, how to measure socioeconomic status is always, I think, debated. Um, quite a lot of measures, I think, do include something about um, education. Um, we certainly, in our analysis, um, can control for that. I'm trying to remember whether we did in the analysis that I showed you there. Um, I'd have to go back to looking look, to look at that NHANES paper to see exactly what we controlled for. Um, education is in the NHANES data set, so um, it would be possible to, to look at that. Um, I guess I'd be interested to know why you think it might be important. Georgia says thanks. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Oh, I, sorry, I've just unmuted. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, I guess I was wondering if just some people have more access to information about healthy and unhealthy diets. So yeah. foods with, you know, whether you should eat foods of particular glycemic index, say. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that was underlying my question. Okay. Um, I mean, um, I can't, I honestly, off the top of my head, can't remember whether we in controlled specifically for education in our NHANES analysis. I don't think we did, but we could do it. I mean, it would be something that we could look at. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an interesting idea. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Georgia. Uh, another question here is from Sagal Balshin. Do males and females uh, in your data set differ in their responses to food insecurity? and in terms of their physiology? Uh, so in, in, hum, in the human data, um, there are differences between um, males and females. So um, it's in Western countries, it's usually only women that seem to show a strong association between food insecurity and, um, and body weight gain. Um, we don't entirely understand why that is, and we spent quite a lot of time speculating about it. Um, Interestingly, that longitudinal data set that I referred to just at the end um, suggests there might be something going on in males in the, in the same way that we're seeing in starlings, in that they become more energy efficient in response to food insecurity. They just don't gain weight. So um, the, the boys were eating less and staying the same, sorry, were eating less and staying the same weight, whereas the girls were um, eating the same and gaining weight. So you, you could. Um, so there does seem to be a sex difference in the way they're responding. Um, and I think it would be really important to go back to the human food insecurity data and try to look at it in terms of energetic efficiency um, rather than just mass gain, because the Starling data certainly suggests that that's the kind of unifying variable there. And there might be quite a lot of variation in, in, in how individuals' um, masses are, are responding depending on their body weight or competition or, or, or whatever. Um, in the starlings, we haven't found any evidence for diff sex differences in how they um, respond to food insecurity. Um, we haven't got a huge amount of data yet, um, but nothing has, nothing's jumped out so far. Okay, so a few other questions are asking if there may be any effect of uh, season or maybe the fact that these were uh, wild caught starlings and if you think it would be any difference if they were captive born. Um, so, um, there is um, at least one paper in Starlings suggesting that um, there might be effects of season um, in that the, the birds are, the Starlings are seasonal breeders um, and um, there, there, is, there is a paper suggesting that which season they think they're in um, affects whether or not you get body weight gain in response to food insecurity. So nobody's looked at efficiency. The focus was all on mass in the previous papers. Um, so I'm not sure um, what that means. Um, it's, I think it's an open question quite what's going on with that. Um, there, might, there might be seasonal effects. I, really, I, I think it's too early to say at the moment. Um, and what about how food insecurity could affect the uh, type or quality of food animals would select if given that option? Well, um, yeah, I mean, we deliberately didn't give them the option to, to choose their, their foods um, because we just wanted to not make things too complicated. Um, and um, 
that is often suggested as one of the things that could be going on in humans that they're they're changing the kinds of foods they're eating to eat more um cheap um calorie dense foods when when they're they're food insecure um interestingly um our nhanes data um showed that food insecure people ate and I think it really suggested more, less fiber when they were, were food insecure. That was something that came out quite clearly. Um, so a really interesting um, thing to think about here is if animals, are, if animals are increasing their energetic efficiency under food insecurity, then you have to ask yourself, why don't they do that all the time? It seems really mad to spend time foraging for food that you don't need to forage for. So there must be some cost to this increase in energetic efficiency that, that we seem to have identified um, to explain why starlings wouldn't always be more energetically efficient. So what is that cost? Um, and trying to think about this, I thought, well, maybe the food's sitting longer um, in the gut if you're getting it, um, getting less of it or le less often. And maybe one of the costs is you're more exposed to toxins in the foods that you're eating. And that could be the possible cost of um, higher energetic efficiency. So you extract more calories from your food by keeping it for longer in your gut, or, um, um, but, but you also get more exposure to toxins. And I mean, it's possible that um, the kinds of foods that have toxins in are more likely to be sort of high fiber things like plants and things. So I, I, I've, I sort of wondered whether that could be a way to think about shifts in diet with food insecurity, that it's not so much driven by um, financial um need or whatever but there may actually be something um something that we've evolved to do there which is to shift away from foods that might be more likely to con contain toxins which i think will probably be more likely to be plants in general because plants put toxins in them to protect themselves from being eaten by insects and herbivores and things so um i think there's an interesting idea there that i quite like to pursue with the starlings to see whether they would shift the kinds of diet um, they act away from things more likely to contain toxins in response to food insecurity. So that's a long answer, but I think there's something really interesting there to be explored that we haven't, we haven't yet had a chance to look at, but it's for the future. And uh, I, I personally find it really interesting that you mentioned uh, depression and how that might be linked to food insecurity. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's another interest of mine. I'm really interested in kind of behavior, mm. um, depression and um, why why we get it and what it's all about and it's there are loads of papers documenting an association between food insecurity and depression in humans and it just did occur to me that um the birds that are doing more roosting under food insecurity look kind of depressed they just go and sit on the perch and and sleep mm -hmm. in the morning when food is available and that looks like a sort of depressed behavior of kind of not taking yeah. advantage of, of food when you've got the opportunity to to go and eat which you think is the exact opposite to what they should be doing if they know that food's going to disappear later in the day and yet they seem to be doing it um, um so this idea that that could be part of a strategy for dealing with um perceived um lack of um, access to food i think is really interesting um yeah i think that perceived lack of control maybe contributes or um i've also been uh there i don't know much about it but the microbiome might be related to right like which chemicals are are circulating so i'd be interesting to know what's going on yeah yeah i'm sure that the um the pattern with which you eat has an effect on your microbiome so um, I don't know much about this at all. I just read a book about the human microbiome and it seems to affect everything pretty much. Um, exactly. Um, I, or I they'd like us to think that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there could well be something interesting going on there, but we haven't even, we haven't even thought about doing anything with that yet because it's complicated. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. And um, you mentioned how even when controlling for the socioeconomic status, that there was some differences based on the country's GDP. Or, or the country's income level? Yeah. Um, I mean, so that's very interesting. So I think, um, I think um, the way we thought, talked about this in, in the original paper was, was the idea that um, in, in high income countries, if, if food insecurity induces a kind of um, uh, a desire to gain weight, um, then it is possible for people to do that because there is more food available in their environments. 
Um, whereas in low income countries, if, if they're food insecure, they just may not be able to eat enough um, in order to gain weight. Um, so at some point, um, I mean, even if you can re re increase your energetic efficiency, there's going to be some point in which you can't take in enough calories to, to gain weight or even sustain your weight. Um, so um, the idea was that maybe in rich countries, it's easier for people to, to gain weight under food insecurity because there's more, more food um, available. Um, so uh, there is some evidence supporting this. If you, if you look at, um, if you ask people in developing countries who are food insecure, they say um, that they would like to be fatter than they currently are. So um, although they're not fatter, um, they say that they would like to be fatter when you ask them in questionnaires. So that's kind of interesting that they sort of have this idea that being fatter would be better. Um, or that it's a sign of... Having, I mean, when we talked about that human literature, we hadn't really got the results on the changes in energetic efficiency. So I think that rather changes how we have to think about this. And um, I need to have another think about that now because... I had been thinking about it purely in terms of how much food you ate, and I think the Starling data has really changed that, and we've really shifted our focus now to thinking about energetic efficiency. So I'm not sure that the arguments we made really, really work anymore. Um, and I just want to take a, a quick tangent to say that it is snowing in uh, Ontario, and also that uh, Georgia Mason thinks you could make quite a few dollars from writing a diet book. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure that's my highest priority right now. It's incredibly nice weather here. It's really, really sunny and um, it's a bank holiday weekend and um, um, yeah, I'm walking around in shorts and sandals, so I'm sorry it's snowing for you. <laughs> you can still wear shorts. No one's going to stop you. But... <laughs> All right. Um, since we're not in a rush, do you mind a few more questions? No, I'm very happy. Very yeah? happy. There's a lot of interest in the crowd. Um, uh, Patrick Barclay would like to know what are the costs of having that higher energetic efficiency? Maybe you've said this already in your in your answers, but why not always be that efficient? It can't just be pred predation, otherwise they would eat less. So I completely agree. I completely agree, Pat. I think this is a real um, uh, problem that we have to address. Um, it's all very well to to um, respond to food insecurity by becoming more energy efficient, but why wouldn't you do it all the time? So there's got to be a cost to it that we need to try and understand. Um, and there are a few things on the table. So um, one idea is that you might have to, you might pay for increased energetic efficiency by down-regulating your immune response. And there is some evidence that food insecure birds are able to amount a less effective um, immune response. So they're temperature during fever if you give them an experimentally induced fever is lower so so maybe you're more prone to um dying from infections um if you're if you've got this higher um energetic efficiency that you have to divert energy from your immune response into um in into um putting on fat so that's one possibility um there's another set of ideas out there that um you basically have to switch the um pathways that your your mitochondria are using to 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 make um energy and um that you switch to a higher efficiency system that um might generate more um um reactive oxygen species so you might have um higher oxidative stress um going with higher energetic efficiency and the long-term cost of that would be that you you might live live less long so you'd be paying for your increased energetic efficiency in the short term through um, uh, sh uh, shorter shorter lifespan. Um, and there's some evidence to suggest that um, we've been trying to look at um, telomere length, which is um, um, a biomarker of, of, of biological age um, in the starlings. So, so Claire Andrews has run a huge study which I showed you the weight data from, where we also measured the telomeres of the birds. Um, and there is some suggestion that the, the birds on, on the unpredictable food um, also have shorter telomeres at the end of the, the um, experiment. So they've got biologically older as a result of, um, of that manipulation. So that would kind of be one other possible idea. 
Um, and then there's this idea of exposure to toxins that I mentioned in response to a previous answer. So there are a number of ideas on the table and we just don't know, we don't know which one is the right one. I think we need to do more to try and understand that. Okay, um, Bob Montgomery has said, as I'm sure you know, uh, work on greenfinch years ago suggested that dominant birds were more lean than subordinates. This was yeah. a bit of a surprise, uh, but makes sense. Do you know if that is relevant to your work? Um, absolutely, I'm very aware of those studies. There's also, um, there's actually an experimental study done by um, um, Mark Witter um, back in the 90s, where he experimentally manipulated dominance in groups of starlings by removing the most dominant bird. And he showed that when he removed a dominant bird from a small group, the, the more subordinate one would actually lose weight following that. So um, dominance definitely um, affects weight gain. And, and it's probably working through food insecurity. So the more dominant birds um, are fatter, sorry are thinner typically because they have secure access to food they can always push everybody else out of the way whereas the more subordinate birds are the ones that get pushed off so they're effectively experiencing food insecurity um, so that all makes sense um, and in fact we've been able to follow this up in this in our um, social foraging system data because um, we can use um, when one RFID tag number uh, replaces another within within a second we can validate that that's one bird uh, displacing another one from the social foraging system and so we could automate the measurement of dominance hierarchies in our little flocks of birds via that means we just search the search the data for when one RFID replaces another and then we can use those to create a, um, a matrix of, of displacements and calculate a dominance hierarchy and we've got some evidence that um, this does actually explain variation um, in um, how much the birds weigh within within a group and that's something that I'm sort of actively looking at at the moment so um, definitely some of the variation is explained by variation in, in where you are in the dominance hierarchy and, and we can look at that in a lot of detail now um, thanks to being able to automate the dominance calculations because that's previously been really time consuming because you've had to do it by videoing the birds and scoring hours of videotape but we can automate that now and get it in real time via an R script. So this is cool. The questions just keep coming. Uh, so I'm going to combine a few. Um, so the questions are if um, the point in life where animals are uh, food insecure or maybe the length of time uh, plays a role. Um, and if this reaction is, is considered adaptive? Oh gosh, um, yeah. So, I mean, we have done a lot of work with the starlings, which I didn't talk about today, where we have effectively manipulated unpredictability in feeding um, for a short period um, early in life. So what we've done is manipulated how much competition chicks had for food um, um, in the nest so basically in the first two weeks whilst they're still chicks in the nest um, and we have shown that those early life manipulations um, have long lasting effects on the body weight of um, the adult birds years later and that's when the birds are all kept in exactly the same conditions so there are long lasting big effects of early life food insecurity on the mass of, of starlings um, which are, re are really interesting. And we've been, we've been kind of worrying away about whether these are adaptive effects or not um, for some time now. It's a really hard thing to test in any kind of convincing way. Um, and I don't think we've really, really got um, an answer. Um, the experiments are long, long um, experiments that are very, very difficult to do. Um, and we've got different results from different experiments, um, which complicates the picture. So. I think it's a complicated story, but what I feel completely convinced about is that what happens to you very early in life if you're a starling affects, um, in terms of food, experienced food insecurity, affects your body weight for the rest of your life. But quite why and whether that's adaptive, um, I'm not quite sure. Can you handle one more question? Oh. Okay. I'm going to combine a few. Uh, people are interested in whether or not 
um, using a migratory species or uh, just in general thinking about birds uh, experiencing habitat fragmentation and um, if that kind of exacerbates the fact are they experiencing more unpredictability um, and do you know if we would see parallel increases in body mass? Uh, <laughs> um, really good question. <laughs> so something I should say about our starlings is that um, the starlings that I'm studying are not migratory. So in the UK, we have um, resident starlings who are here year round. Um, and then we get migratory birds that come from Eastern Europe um, and spend the winter here and then go back. Um, to their home countries to breed um, and I think all of the work I've done has been on the UK resident population so they're not migratory I don't, uh, I don't know whether there'd be differences if you studied migratory birds um, sorry I've now forgotten what the rest of the question is about now oh, or just uh, general wild birds who are experiencing habitat loss or fragmentation and if that's becoming more yeah. unpredictable and therefore they're putting on weight yeah well, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think it would be very reasonable to expect that they might. Um, the, birds, the birds seem to be incredibly plastic in terms of their body weight and their body weights can respond very rapidly, as you saw in my, my data, to quite short periods of, um, of quite subtle changes in, in um, predictability of food. So, I mean, these operant schedules, it's not a really big difference and the birds, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not starving. And, and indeed, they're able to put on weight and yet, and yet it's having these effects on their body weight. So I think um, it seems obvious that quite small changes in the environment could be, could be altering their, their body masses. Um, I mean, there's lots of data showing that, that birds put on mass uh, during the winter when food becomes more unpredictable. So lots of kind of correlational data from field studies. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually compared populations of the same species subject to kind of more fragmented habitats versus ones that have got not got that. I mean, that might be an interesting thing to do. I don't know. I think it would be very hard to know what was driving it exactly. Um, the nice thing about our system is we've got really good control in the lab so we can really, we know what we're, we're manipulating. Um, and final question is, um, I mean, in that lab environment, it's, it's slightly enriched, right? You've got perches and litter. Um, do you think that boredom would have played a role if um, there was a more barren housed environment that the starlings were in? Well, I don't know about boredom, but I mean, I've really been trying to make the argument that um, you need a kind of more naturalistic setup for studying this question and that using kind of rats or mice that are kept in really small cages where they can't do a lot of their normal behavior um, might, you might just end up missing a lot because you know if it's to do with birds cutting down on environmental exploration or bathing or social behavior or whatever in order to save energy then you might not see that if you've got an animal housed on its own in a very tiny cage so I think um, it's really important to have animals that can exhibit a whole range of, of, of behaviors um, in order to try and look at the ways in which they're adapting to food insecurity. And I think you really might miss something if you had your animal in a very impoverished environment where it couldn't do much. So I think there are big implications here for thinking about, you know, why we should do experiments with, you know, good welfare for our animals. That I think it really, really has an impact on, on the science. Um, so what I've done is um, I've saved some of the questions. There's a few I had to skip out on, but I think I think we've grilled you enough. Um, we've really enjoyed this uh, and I know everyone else has as well. So uh, we appreciate your time today uh, sharing your, your research and your experience with us. Um, and as a thank you, uh, there should be something coming in the mail if it hasn't come out. Oh, okay. So that's have fun funny. shopping. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's everything. Is there anything else? Oh. Uh, people are clapping virtually, so thank you for that. A lot of claps all around, um, applause all around. <laughs> and is there anything else you'd like to say before we uh, close up here? Well, just thank you everybody for listening to my talk. Um, and if anybody wants to um, engage in further discussions, you know, over Zoom, I'd be really happy to do that at some point. Um, you know, individually, if you're interested in following up any of the ideas I've talked about. I kind of went over a lot of stuff really quickly and I'm, I'm really keen to talk more about this um, 
informally because we won't have the normal drinks or whatever that we would have at a conference so um, let me know by email if you want to follow up on something and we can do it at some point but thanks very much for, for coming to my talk and for all the great questions yeah and thank you so much for your time uh, we've recorded this and we will be posting it on youtube um, hopefully as soon as possible so thanks folks thank you thanks for joining <laughs>